Hello, my name is Robin Belton and I am a PhD student in the math department at Montana State University. And today I will be giving an introduction to directed topology. So I will describe the motivating applications for this field, um, specifically concurrent computing. I'll define directed spaces, introduce some questions that have been explored, and then I'll end with some open questions in the field. All right, so a few key people who helped develop and have contributed a lot to this field are Elizabeth Badstrup, Eric Goldbalt, and Martin Rousen. And they started developing directed topology in the 90s and were motivated by a few applications. And so that includes studying concurrency, hybrid dynamical systems, and motion planning. And I'm going to focus on concurrency because this is the one I've read the most about and I am the most familiar with. And so concurrent computing is when you have multiple computations, also known as like processes or threads that are executed concurrently. So during the same time or overlapping periods instead of sequentially. Uh, so the main challenge with concurrent computing is coordinating access to shared resources. So you want to make sure that when different processes are trying to access a shared resource, that share, shared resource isn't going over maximum capacity. So there are some sharing problems to work out. And in order to describe concurrency, I am going to talk about the dining philosopher's problem, which was developed or formulated in the 1960s by Edgar Dijkstra. And I'll explain it with two philosophers. And so my two philosophers are gonna be Santiago and the alchemist from the famous novel, The Alchemist by Paulo Kahlo. And I picked this novel because a big theme is pursuing personal legends. And I see pursuing a PhD in math as my current personal legend, and so it seemed fitting to have those characters here. All right, so the game or the problem is we want Santiago and the alchemists to be able to eat their bowl of spaghetti, and we want to design a set of directions in order for them to do that, but there are a couple caveats. Uh, namely, one is that you need both utensils to eat the spaghetti, can't just use one, and the other is that only one person can be holding a utensil at a time. Yes, so how are we gonna tell Santiago and the alchemist to eat spaghetti? Well, here is one idea. You know, we're gonna write our directions or our program such that when the person sees that their utensil to their left is free, they pick it up. And when they see the utensil on the right is free, they pick it up and then they eat the spaghetti and then they put down the utensils. Seems like that should work, but it doesn't. And so both Santiago and the alchemist will pick up the utensil to their left and then they can't pick up anything else. And so they're in this eternal starvation phase. So it's very sad and we have to go back to the drawing board. And so let us draw a nice geometric model for this game. And so we're gonna have this grid and each axis is gonna represent what each person is doing. And P is gonna stand for pick up and V is gonna stand for release. And so on the X axis, we have Santiago's actions. He's gonna be picking up the fork, the spoon, and then eating and then putting down the spoon and the fork. And the alchemist is doing a similar sequence of actions. Each point on the board is gonna describe what both Santiago and the alchemist are doing. So at this point, the alchemist is picking up the spoon and Santiago is picking up the fork. We see in this red region here, this is where both the alchemist and Santiago have picked up the fork, but this is an illegal move in the game. So this region here is forbidden. And we have another forbidden region, and this is where both the alchemist and Santiago have picked up the spoon. All right, so let's get rid of these forbidden regions. And so now Negra is describing the states that can happen in the game. 
Now we can look at paths. And so paths from bottom left vertex to top right vertex are gonna describe different executions that are possible with this game. And so with this blue path here, Santiago is gonna pick up his utensils, eat the spaghetti, put down the utensils, and then the alchemist will uh, pick up the utensils, eat and put down the utensils. And this is a valid way to play the game, which is correct, taking turns. The orange path is also a correct way to play the game. We're gonna have the alchemist eat the spaghetti first this time. Great, so now we have a nice model that shows us the different ways we can play the spaghetti game by having these nice directed paths from this bottom left vertex to this top right, where these paths are gonna be non-decreasing in both X and Y coordinates. So either going right or going up. And the orange paths are the ways to play the game where the alchemist eats first and then Santiago and the blue, we have Santiago eats first and the alchemist. Uh, for the two blue paths that you see here, the difference between them is just the timings of when events happen. All right, so we have this nice model uh, for the spaghetti game and then we can use this model for other concurrent programs, which is great, but there might be a couple of questions we wanna answer. So one, is there a way to use local information from our grid or our complex in order to understand these directed path spaces? So this is a local to global problem. And then the second question is, is there a good way to simplify these complexes so we can see these path spaces a bit better? Uh, for example, if we go back here, there are uncountably infinitely many paths from bottom left vertex to top right. However, there are really only two ways to play the game. Sam, uh, Santiago eats first and the alchemist or vice versa. So are there, is there a nice smaller complex that clearly shows these two ways? And so now we're gonna dive into some terminology. So elementary cubes are analogs to simplices, but in cube form. So in zero dimensions, we are gonna have a vertex and then an edge in one dimension, square in two dimensions, three-dimensional cube in three dimensions, et cetera. And we're gonna have our vertices be integer coordinates. And we're always gonna have our length, area, volume be of, be of unit one. And then when we attach these elementary cubes nicely, we're gonna get a Euclidean cubical complex such as here. And specifically, we're gonna always have our cubes on integer coordinates. So our directed space is we're gonna start off with the topological space. So in our example, it's the Euclidean cubical complex, which is a subspace of Rn endowed with that standard topology. And then we're gonna have a directed path space. And for our Euclidean cubical complexes, we're considering paths that are non-decreasing in all coordinates. And so in orange and blue, we see some examples of directed paths. And we can talk about directed path spaces between two particular points. And so here we have X and Y and illustrating three directed paths in this directed path space. All right, homotopy. So this is a big term in topology where you wanna continuously deform one path to the other through a bunch of intermediate paths. And in this example, the blue path is homotopic to the green path. Now extending that to directed homotopy or dihomotopy is we wanna have a homotopy between two paths, um, but it also needs that each intermediate path is directed in the homotopy. So this is an, an example of a dihomotopy. Here are some examples of not dihomotopic paths. So on the left, the blue and orange path just aren't homotopic to begin with, so they're not gonna be dihomotopic. And then on the right, we have this three by three by three cube where the interior is removed. And so in the undirected setting, the blue and orange path are homotopic. However, they are not dihomotopic because if we tried to uh, go from the blue path to the orange by going up and over 
or down and up, we're going to run into paths that are not directed. All right. So we've talked about directed paths, which are global property of directed spaces. So what now is a local thing to study about our complexes? And one that has been studied a lot is the pass link of a vertex. So we have a vertex, and then we're going to look at all the elementary cubes that are within one unit of V, um, but also have V as that maximum vertex. And now we're going to take all these cubes and we're going to create this abstract simplicial complex from it in a specific way. And so in this example, how it's the abstract simplicial complex we get are going to be those two edges connected at one vertex. And this is the pass link of that vertex. All right, so what's so great about pass links and directed path spaces? Well, there's this really cool theorem that me and some of my collaborators proved, which is if we have our complex and we look at each vertex and we see that the pass link of that vertex is connected, then all our directed path spaces starting at some initial minimum vertex are also going to be connected. So that's a nice result. And it also holds for contractibility. And then there are some nice uh, converses and partial converses there. So because of this relationship between pass links and pass spaces, a method for compressing these complexes is through collapsing using pass links. And so that's has been talked about in another paper that me and my collaborators are a part of, if you want to look more into that. And so those are some nice quick overviews of local to global and how we can simplify complexes. And so now here are some open questions. So one is how do we find a Euclidean cubical subcomplex that preserves the diahomotopic classes of spaces of directed paths? So the example shown here we can perform a sequence of those link preserving directed collapses from left to right. And on the right, we can clearly see the two ways to play the spaghetti game. And so that's ideally what we wanna do for every complex. So uh, what kind of algorithm can we implement in order to get this nice small sub complex? And then the other question is, what other applications can be modeled from directed topology? So we've seen concurrent computing, some motion planning, some hybrid dynamical systems. What else? What else could there be? And so those are some fun things that can be explored. And with that, I will end there and I hope you learned some new things. All right.